lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. I wonder how many of us this morning you know for sure, without a doubt, 100%, that you are a child of God, that you are born again, that your sins are forgiven, that you have a home in heaven. How many know that this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. And if you're here today and you couldn't raise your hand, then at the end of this service, an opportunity will be given for you to trust Jesus Christ. You can be a child of God today. Amen. There's no reason to delay. No reason. And uh, that being said, he's speaking to us as unto children, as because we are God's children. You know, we, we may uh, grow up physically, but we are always God's children if we're saved. And notice, he's speaking unto us as unto the children of God. He says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, if ye endure chastening. And that's the title of the message this morning, If Ye Endure Chastening. God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us, after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. This message I'm going to preach this morning for a child of God, um, if you will heed what I'm saying to you this morning, it will transform your life spiritually. Chastening and correction from God is a way of life. It's a way of the Christian life. Uh, say, I don't like it. Well, God's word says we probably wouldn't like it. He said, it's grievous, but nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So what I'm saying, especially to Christians this morning, is this. If you will get a hold of this truth, it will transform your life. If you'll get a hold of this truth, it will transform your outlook in the Christian life. It'll transform your outlook regarding seemingly negative circumstances. I, I beg you this morning to heed the truth I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach most of this message. At the very end, I'm going to give three quick points. Three ways people respond to God's correction. And I'm going to ask God to do a work in our hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you will speak to our hearts. I know you will if we'll listen. And uh, you know the needs in this room. I pray that every Christian will uh, embrace these truths. Lord, we won't look at them as a negative truth. We won't look at them as uncomfortable, but instead we'll embrace this truth and realize it is the key to our success in the Christian life. It is the key to our peace. It is the key to our happiness in life. I pray that you'll help every Christian to realize that this morning. And then if there be someone here or a few folks that don't know you as Savior, I pray that they'll trust you today. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. In Hebrews 12, two of the verses here, he's quoting from the book of Proverbs. And uh, verses 5 and 6, he's actually quoting from Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, which we will look at that in a minute. But there are some words I want to define here that are mentioned over and over throughout this passage. Uh, the first word is chastening. Again, if you're not careful, you, I'll, I'll give you these teachings in the very beginning and you'll think, well, this, this isn't a message I really want to hear. It's negative. It, by the way, we need some negative things. We do. You know, just like we, we need, uh, there's some diseases we want to stay away from, right? 
Um, but this is important. What I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I beg you, hear me. I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating this. I, every truth will change your life. It will. Every truth will transform your life. But this truth, if you will cling to it, if you'll understand it, I'm telling you, it'll transform your Christian life. It'll transform your view of the Christian life. If ye endure chastening. So one word used over and over here is chastening or chastisement, chastened. And what does that mean? It means correction. It means afflicting for the purpose of correction. It means punishment for the purpose of reclaiming. Chastening. God said he chastens his children. One sure way you know you're a child of God is if God chastens you. Another word here that was mentioned is the word rebuked. Nobody likes rebuke. Nobody loves rebuke um, just by itself. We don't like to be told we're wrong. How many of you just love being... Now look, I, I know in wisdom, if, if you're wise, you want to know the truth. But the initial rebuke is not always fun. When you, you have to say, I was wrong. That really hurts. In fact, let's just practice it this morning. Let's get it off our chest. Ready? Let's go ahead. Say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Yes, you were. No, <laughs> please forgive me. Don't you feel better now like you've had a bath? That just feels good. By the way, that is important. It is important to admit when you're wrong and to ask forgiveness. It's important. Uh, but we need correction. The word is rebuke. It means to chide, to scold. You know, have you ever heard a teen say, my parents are always on my case. What do they mean? I'm being rebuked. To chide, to scold, to reprove, to check, to restrain, to reprehend for a fault, to stop or oppose you when you are headed down the wrong path. That's what it means to be rebuked. Uh, my wife and I and our two sons were coming back uh, from uh, Cincinnati the other night. and We were coming back. It was late. And uh, there was construction going on, and there was a, a lane we were supposed to be going in, and a pickup truck was in the wrong lane, and he actually bowled, he, he mowed over a construction barrel. The barrel was stuck under his truck, wedged, and he was still driving. And he was driving straight at us in our lane. And the construction worker went out there, and he goes, stop! And the guy kept going. He goes, he goes stop! And the, he, he tried to reach under, and the guy started inch forward. He goes, stop! The guy finally stopped. He pulls the barrel out from under the guy's truck. He's like, get in that lane. That's being rebuked. You were in the wrong lane. You were going the wrong way. Stop. That's embarrassing. You know, if you're the one who, where the construction barrel's under your truck and everybody's watching and you're being told to stop, that's embarrassing. Stop. That's rebuke. Nobody enjoys that. Um... Another word that's used here is the word scourgeth. Does, does that mean, really mean what I think it means? It absolutely means what you think it means. It means to whip. Or as some parents might say, to whoop. <laughs> How many of you have ever got whoopings growing up? You know there's a difference between a whooping and a whipping, right? <laughs> there's a difference. Uh, spankings, you know, that's nothing compared to a whooping. The word scourgeth literally means to whip, to lash, to punish with severity. I know the, I know the world we live in. Let me just, I'm going to just do a little straw poll here. just want your favor here. Not really, but I really do. I do want to run a straw poll. How many of you think our world is in better shape today than it's ever been? Our families are in better shape. Kids are being raised better than ever. How many of you would think that? Then we're all in agreement. How many think it's probably worse than it has been? Yeah. I'll tell you one of the reasons it's worse is we've gotten away from the, God's word. We've gotten away from biblical truth. By the way, there are Christian parents that have bought into this nonsense that says you don't spank your children. Now let me tell you something. First of all, there is a difference between discipline and abuse. There is. God gave children a padded anatomy in a certain place, gave us all that. And there is a place for discipline. Now, I will caution you that you need to be careful how and where you do it because of the world we live in. So you need to use some wisdom. But that being said, 
You can speak to my own children. They, they, were, they were raised by the Board of Education the same way I was. My mom's here. I was raised by the Board of Education. It was applied to the seat of learning when I needed it. Uh, in fact, I just want to look at what God's Word says, and we have to decide whether God has it right or the culture has it right. I think you already know the answer, but let's look at Proverbs 13, verse 24. So I, I, I love my kids too much to spank them. No, you don't. You love yourself. Do you hear what I said? You love yourself. You want to feel better and you want to be a buddy to them. What they really need is a parent to go, stop. You're going down the wrong path. Stop. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod. What's the next word? Hateth his son. I love it. No, no. Read what God's word said. See, if I'm, if I'm not willing to risk, look, a preacher who's not willing to preach a hard truth because he's afraid of offending you doesn't love you. A preacher who loves you is going to tell you the truth even when it hurts. A parent who loves their children is going to oppose them when they're going the wrong way. And right here it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. And the word be times doesn't mean over and over. It means immediately when he needs it. That's how God deals with us. You know, you're going you're gonna to discipline your children. You go, remember what you did a week and a half ago? You don't do that. The moment something needs to take place, you take care of it. Immediately. You correct it. Be times. It means immediately when it's needed. Um, look at Proverbs 19, verse 18. Proverbs 19, verse 18. The Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. What does that mean? There's a day coming when there is not hope. A meaning there's a day coming when that discipline will not even be effective. That's what it means. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Follow God's word. They're, they're crying, I think they've changed. They, they've changed because they saw the, the belt or the paddle or the switch. Um, for some of you, this is shocking because you didn't know this is in the Bible. I'm telling you, this is one of the reasons our culture is in shambles. Because there aren't parents at home who love their children enough to enforce this kind of discipline. Proverbs 22, look at verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child... Not my child. Hold on. Not my child. I know the teacher's lying about my child again. I know the youth director's lying about my child again. My child would never lie to me. Hello? <laughs> so your child's the exception. No, I'm going to tell you, in all children... Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. By the way, I'll just recommend the Bible method is a rod. I'd encourage you parents, don't use your hand for corporal punishment because your hand is to be to protect and love. You, make, you, you have Mr. Discipline in your home. Let it be a paddle or a belt or a switch. Your hand should not be associated with that, but I think your... Uh, that paddle, that rod should be. Uh, by the way, I still, I, I'm not old, I'm middle-aged. Uh, that means some days I'm old, some days I'm young. That's what it means. But, but I still, in my day, there was still a paddle in the school in Tennessee when I was there for four years. Amen. And uh, the, the teachers would drill holes in the paddle. Say, why? So it'd move faster. <laughs> That's really why they did it. <laughs> you hear the of the air coming through the whoosh. Say, did you ever hear that? Twice I did hear it. <laughs> Twice. I heard it. Um, and it hurt me. <laughs> but you know what it really does? It hurts your pride more than it hurts your backside, and it gets your attention. Um, notice, the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Look at Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, verse 13. It says, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Do you, do you understand this? It's very important to understand. 
it's better for your child to get corrected in your home than for a judge to have to do it one day. Or, or a cop or a, uh, a prison warden. Somebody who doesn't care about your child. It's better for them in the confines of your home to get some correction. Um, notice Proverbs 29, verse 15. Proverbs 29, verse 15. And notice the rod is never by itself. It's not just a matter of inflicting some punishment. It's coupled with something. Notice Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. The rod is not designed to be by itself. It's to be coupled with reproof. The whole purpose of the rod is to get the attention of the child so they'll receive the reproof. That's the whole point of it. So they'll change. So they'll receive the stop. You're going down the wrong road. So the words here in Hebrews 12 chastening, rebuke, scourge. It literally means what it says, whipping, lashing, punishing with severity. Uh, there's a fourth word, and the word is corrected. And that word literally means to bring back from error or deviation, to make right, to bring back, notice this, or attempt to bring back to propriety. Number one, quickly, in Hebrews 12, I want you to see what the motive for chastening and correction and all these things should always be. What should the motive always be? Love, always. Notice verse 6. Whom the Lord, what's the next word? Loveth, he chasteneth. Why does God discipline his children? Because he hates us? No, because he loves you. Because he loves me. Uh, if you notice your child doing something dangerous and they're not listening, and you get their attention with some discipline, is it because you hate them? No, it's because you love them enough to stop them. You love them enough to set them on the straight and narrow until they're ready and disciplined and mature enough to do it themselves. I want you to notice another word there. Not only does he love, but notice what it says. Verse 6, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth, yes, literally gives whoopings, scourgeth every son whom he, what's the next word? Receiveth. Can I say another word to your parents? If you give discipline to your children, don't send them off to their room. Don't send them off to their room. Keep them close by you. The message you send by sending them away from you is now you can't be near me. Once you've disciplined them, immediately they're accepted in the beloved. Guess what? We're accepted in the beloved with God. Ephesians 1 says we are accepted in the beloved. The very fact that God corrects us tells us we're accepted. The very fact God corrects us and reproves us and rebukes us and chastens us tells us we're in the family. You know, if you're at, at a basketball game, you watch the coach go up and down the court. How many times have you seen a good coach ream out or yell at one of his players? Why does he do that? Because he hates his player? No, because he knows that that player can be better. Uh, do you watch the coach? Does he ever cross the court and go coach the other team's players? Does he ever do that? Why not? Because they're not his players. The very fact that he corrects this player says he's accepted in the beloved. The very fact he says something to this player means, hey, you're part of my team. You know, you go to Walmart. Hopefully you don't go correct other people's kids. Hopefully you correct your own kids. What does that tell them when you correct your kids? Hey, you're in the family. You're part of this family. Folks, when we are corrected of God, we need to understand his motive. It's always love, and we need to understand that it means we are received. We are accepted in the beloved. Say, God's mad at me. God doesn't want anything to do with me. No, it's the opposite. The very fact that he's correcting you says you're already accepted. You're already loved. You're already received. The motive is love. Number two, I want you to see the method of correction. When Jesus corrected the churches in Revelation, what did he do? He first gave them praise and expressed his love. Then he rebuked them. So parents, you're going to correct your children. And this is for any correction. He expressed his love first. Then he got, gave the rebuke. And then he finished with expressing his love again. 
What did he say to the church in Laodicea that was a lukewarm church? He said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And then I want you to see the results of chastening and correction. Look at verse 11. Now no chastening for the present, right now, seemeth to be joyous. It's not joyous. It's grievous. Notice. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Do we really enjoy it when God steps on our toes or gives us a spiritual spanking? Do we enjoy that? Do do we enjoy when we have to confront our children and say, stop? No, we don't enjoy that. For the present, it's not joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, notice the result afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You want peace? Accept God's correction. You want peace in your heart? Realize correction is a part of life. Chastening from the Heavenly Father is a part of being a child of God. So I just want to, I just want to show up to church and be told how wonderful I am. I just want to show up to church and, and somebody just tell me how good I am. One of my children, and not just one, but one in particular more so, uh, early on in school, when I would correct something they did, they'd get very upset. And I would tell them this. I'd say, listen, school is not here to show me how wonderful you are. I already think you're wonderful. I love you. You're my child. School is here to show you where your weaknesses are. School is here to show you what you need to work on. School is here to show you what you need to get better at. I've had people say, well, I come to church and I feel like I'm always, you know, there's always something else I have to do. Good. Good. You know what that means? It means you're being challenged to be more like Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I like that illustration. If you go out to the shooting range, you aim at the bullseye and you miss. What do you do? You just say, well, I'm not very good, so I'll just aim off the bullseye to feel better about myself. Look, I missed again. Look, I missed again. No, what do you do? You work. You correct things so you can hit the target. The results of correction, immediately when you receive rebuke or correction, they're not joyous, they're grievous. But afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. David said this, he said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Before God corrected me, I was just going on my own path, but then God afflicted me. Now I'm obeying his word. Psalm 119.75, he says, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Lord, because you love me, because you're faithful to me, you're willing to bring things into my life to get my attention. And then last of all, number four, don't get excited because that's the whole message. Number four, the responses to correction. What is your response when you're corrected? Say, I'm a grown adult. I, I don't need correction. We all need cor- correction all the time. From God's word, we need correction. To say we don't need correction is to say we've arrived, that everything we're doing is just perfect and we don't need any help. But we all always need correction. There are three responses to correction found in this passage. I've seen this over and over. By the way, this is true whether it be on a basketball court with a coach and his players, whether it be true with a pastor in a church, whether it be true with parents and their children, whether it be true with a boss at work, whether it be true with a friend and another friend or a teacher in a classroom, these three responses are common. And the first two, I'll tell you this, lead to that person's destruction. The first two responses lead to the person being corrected to their destruction. The third response is the right response and that which will lead to happiness, peace, and blessing in life. The first response, if you'll look in Hebrews 12, 5, he again is encouraging believers. He says, ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Notice the first response. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. The first response people have to correction is despising it, hating it, hating the person who corrects them. 
That attitude towards correction is a sure plan for destruction. I want you to go back to my story of the man who was in the wrong lane with the construction barrel stuck under his truck. Was it embarrassing for the construction worker to come out and go, Stop! You're going the wrong way. Stop. Go on the other path. Was that embarrassing? Of course it was. People were watching. Traffic was being held up. It was embarrassing. But no, not near as bad as if he had continued going down the wrong way, the wrong lane. It could have led to his death, someone else's death. Despising chastening, despising correction is a common response, but it leads to destruction. Go to, back to Proverbs. Keep your finger again here in Hebrews. Look at Proverbs 3. And again, this is the passage that is being quoted in Hebrews 12. Look at he Proverbs 3. And look at verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. What does that mean? Get tired of it. I'm so sick of my parents being on my case. Man, I'm so sick of coming to church and I got something else to work on. Neither be weary of his correction, for whom the Lord loveth he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Look at verse 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. You want to be happy? Receive correction. Receive correction. Look at Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. Again, the first response to correction is to despise it. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Don't tell me what to do. I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me what to do. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Look at Proverbs 15, please. Proverbs 15, verse 5. Proverbs 15, verse 5, it says, A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Look at verse 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall, what's the next word? Die. Look at verse 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. Look at verse 32. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. Who are you hurting if you ignore correction God brings into your life? You're hurting yourself. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. We have to, we have to change our mindset to realize when God corrects us, he's not our enemy. He's our loving heavenly father. When somebody, teens, when your parents correct you, they're not your enemy. They love you. Uh, again, th this applies to every area of life. I, I read about three weeks ago about a basketball player. He, was, he had great talent. He came to this team and the coach said that this basketball player in front of the other said, you will never correct me in front of this team. What was he saying? You're not going to embarrass me. That basketball player never went on to do anything much at all. Why? Because he couldn't be corrected. What I'm saying is that, that's one silly little example of basketball game, but that's how it is in every area of life. We have to be willing to be correct, corrected. We have to. Uh, look at Proverbs. Um, Proverbs, where was I at before? 15, 32. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that re heareth reproof getteth understanding. Look at Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, verse 9. Proverbs 23, verse 9 says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Can I ask you something? Can God correct you? Do you let him correct you? Can God get your attention? Did you come to God? Does God have to bring scourging and huge chastening to get your attention? Or do you have a sensitive heart towards God where you're just saying, God, speak to my heart. God, you just tell me and I'll listen. God, you just tell me and I'll obey. I'll change. The first response to correction is to despise it. 
and it always leads to destruction. There's another response back in Hebrews 12, which is not quite as... Um, aggressive but yet the response the, the, the end of this is the same there's another response which is not the correct response to correction and that is notice verse 5 again you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children my son despise not thou the chasing of the Lord don't miss this one nor faint when thou art rebuked of him there's a second response to correction, and that's, being, that's fainting when you're rebuked. What does that mean? Giving up, quitting. And usually that giving up and quitting is based on feeling hurt. Well, the pastor hurt my feelings because he told me that. The coach hurt my feelings because he said I needed to work on my free throws. The boss hurt my feelings. If you get down to the bottom of that hurt, it's rooted in something that may surprise you. It's rooted in pride. It's rooted in pride. He said, don't faint when you're rebuked. As I said, one of my children who would, when I would correct them in school, they would get a little bit upset and I would tell them, this isn't to show how wonderful you are. This is, I already think you are. I already love you. You're already accepted. I'm correcting you to show you where improvement is needed. You know, it'd be more fun, I, I guess, not when I stand before God, but it'd be more fun on Sundays if I could just stand up here every week and tell all of you how great you are, tell you how great I am. That'd be, that'd be easier. Folks, we don't have anything to work, work, work on this week. Just, we've all arrived. Just, just perfect. God bless you, and I do want God to bless you. It, it's not as fun to have to preach some hard truths or, or bring out some correction, but it's more necessary. Amen. There are a lot of Christians that when God rebukes them, God speaks to their heart, corrects them, they just give up. They say, well, then I guess I just won't do anything for Christ. I give up. I quit. I feel hurt. That's not a proper response to correction. There's a third response, which is the right response to correction. When God reproves us, when God corrects us, what is it? Go back to Hebrews 12, verse 7. Here it is. If ye, what's the next word? Endure. What does that mean? It means you put up with it. I'm telling you, this is a big key to the Christian life. I'm telling you, this is a big key to life itself. If ye, what's the next word? Endure chastening. What does that mean? It means it's not fun. Um, originally, for the present, it's grievous. It's not joyous. It's never fun to get corrected. So what do we have to do? We have to learn to endure it. How do we endure it? Remembering God's motive. What's God's motive? It's love. It's that he's already received us, that we're already accepted in the beloved. That's his motive, always. So the key is to learn to endure chastening. Look at Proverbs 6, verse 23. Proverbs 6, verse 23, endure correction. You know, the Bible says this, going back to preaching, it says the time will come when people will not... Does anybody know the next word? Endure sound doctrine. But will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Hey, just tell us what we want to hear. Don't, don't challenge us. Don't, don't try to set us straight. Just, just tell us how great we are. That day is here, I believe, in, in our society. You know, to come to this church, you have to love the Word of God. You have to. Because we are in the Word of God so much. Look at Proverbs 6.23, what it says. It says, for the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and don't miss this part, and reproofs of instruction are the way of, what's the next word? Life. That's the way of life. Something gets off a little bit, God corrects you, you respond, you endure it. You say, God, I'll, I'll obey you. That's the way of life. You despise it, that's the way of death. You faint, well, I just give up then. 
I just quit on God. If I'm not good enough for that, then oh well, I'm just not good enough. You faint? It's a way of death. But you endure it. Knowing the motive is love. That's the way of life. Look at Proverbs 29, verse 17. Proverbs 29, verse 17. It's speaking to human parents, but it's also referring to our Heavenly Father. Notice what it says. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Go back to Hebrews 12. How do we endure chastening? Let me show you quickly. How do we endure chastening? How should we endure chastening? Notice verse uh, 9. In fact, go back to verse 7. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Look at verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. How do you endure chastening? First of all, with reverence. Not disrespect to who's correcting you, especially God. Reverence. If God corrects us, do you think we need it? We do. I'll, okay, I'll say I do. I do. With reverence. How else do we respond? Notice next what he says. We have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection? What does that mean? It means you yield. You humble yourself. You obey. So if God corrects you, what should you do? Show respect to God and yield and obey. Let's go back to the basketball scenario. The coach tells you, you're not hustling up and down that court enough. What should you do? Reverence. Respect your coach. Yield and obey. You know what's going to happen? You argue with that coach. You're going to ride the pine. You're going to sit the bench. Uh, your parents come to you and they say, look, I'm concerned about this and this and this and this. Why are you always on my case? No. Reverence. Reverence, subjection, yield and obey. I'm telling you now, this is the key to the Christian life. So I just want to get to the place where I arrive and I don't ever have to be corrected again. Wonderful. One day when you're just like Jesus. One day when I'm just like Jesus. That day will come. Praise God. It's coming, but it's not now. Right now, guess what I need? Correction. Guess what you need? Correction. Endure chastening with reverence, with subjection. Notice what he says next, verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down. God's always on my case. Lift up the hands that hang down. You know what he's telling you? Get busy again. Serve. Well, if I'm not good enough, I'm just not... No. Serve. Lift up the hands which hang down. Notice next what he says. And the feeble knees stand. Well, if I'm not good enough, stand for Christ. No, stand. Stand up. Stop feeling sorry for yourself because God corrected you. Serve. Stand. Notice next. And make straight paths for your feet. Stay straight. God put you on the straight and narrow. Stay there. Stay there. And then notice next. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Surrender, submit to what God has showed you. Yield, obey. I'm telling you now, this is a key. It is a key to the Christian life. It's a key to all of life. Learning to receive correction, to, to, to make yourself better. Look, what, what's the fruit of it? The fruit of it is peace. The fruit of it is happiness. The fruit of it is blessing. That's the fruit of it. It might be that you're here today and the truth is you're lost. You're on the wrong path. You're trusting baptism or good works or some other thing to get you to heaven. I'm here to correct that misunderstanding and tell you the only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross for you. He was buried. He rose again. And if you'll place your faith and trust in him, he'll save you today. And if you're here and you're saved, I want to encourage you to embrace this truth. Embrace it. That when God corrects you, it's not because he hates you. When God corrects you, it's because he loves you and wants you to have peace and blessing and happiness and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. They're the way of life. Let's bow our heads together, please. If ye endure chastening, nobody likes correction. No, it just at, at, the, at the first initial rebuke or the initial chastening, nobody likes that. But what we do like is the fruit of it if we will yield, if we'll respond correctly. The three most common ways people can despise chastening. They get angry at God. They get angry at somebody who corrected them. And that always leads to destruction. You can faint when you're rebuked. Give up, quit. Or you can endure chastening. Endure it. With reverence, you can endure it with subjection, yield and obey. Are you enduring chastening as a child of God? Look, it's part of the Christian life. God loves us enough to chasten us. He loves us enough to correct us. Why? He doesn't want us to be like the world. He doesn't want us to be like this age. He doesn't. He wants you different. He wants you to live a life holy unto Him. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder who would say this morning, Pastor, I know for sure I'm a child of God. If I died today, I know I'd go to heaven because I, Jesus Christ is my Savior. My sins are forgiven. I have a home in heaven. And I want to thank Jesus for paying the price for me. I know I'm saved. If that's you, would you lift your hand? I know I'm saved. Praise the Lord. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Who would say, Pastor, I can't say that. I'm not 100% sure that when I die, I'm going to heaven and I sure would like to know how to be saved. I'd like to know Christ is my Savior. If that's you, would you lift your hand this morning? I'd like to have that settled. Lift your hand up right now. Someone will take a Bible and show you how to be saved. Heads are still bowed. Eyes are still closed. Christian, reproofs of instruction are the way of life. God chastens us because we are loved. God chastens us because we are accepted in the beloved. God chastens us because we're his children. Correction, chastening, all those things are part of the Christian life. It really matters how we respond. Be careful that you don't despise Hebrews 3 says not to despise him that speaketh from heaven. Be careful you don't despise when you're corrected. That leads to death and destruction. Be careful that you don't faint. You don't just give up and quit when you're corrected. The proper response, the proper response is to endure. Put up with it. It's not pleasant initially, but the end of it is joy. The end of it is peace. The end of it is happiness. When we respond correctly, when we give reverence, when we subject ourselves, when we yield to what God wants for us. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Who would say, Heavenly Father, I want to yield to you. I want to humble myself. I'm not, I don't want to faint. I don't want to despise when you correct me. Instead, with reverence, I want to yield and obey you for my own blessing, for my own benefit. Help me, Lord, to be a wise child of yours and receive correction. Help me, Lord. If that's you, would you lift your hand to the Lord? Just humble your heart to him. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts now. Again, I pray that you'll accomplish that which you desire in each heart. Help us to yield to you whatever you've shown to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.